Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video we will be continuing with the novel Rendezvous with Rama by Arthur C. Clarke. The first part of the novel will be in a link in the upper right corner and now let's continue with the second part to Rendezvous with Rama. Lieutenant Commander Boris Rodrigo came to Commander Norton. He wanted permission to use the ship's priority to send a direct message to Earth. It wasn't to be a personal message, it was a message to the Mother Church on Earth. Boris was a cosmochrister and he believed he knew what the purpose of Rama was. He believed that Rama was a cosmic ark sent to save those worthy of salvation. He believes that when Rama goes into Perhelion, it will decelerate and go into a parking orbit around Earth. Commander Norton decided to have Boris pass on his idea to the Rama committee along with a copy going to his church. He did this as a compromise. Once they had waited the prescribed 48 hours for the storms inside of Rama to die down, they went back in. Once they got back in, Commander Norton noticed that the light had changed. It was no longer a harsh blue but reminded him of a mellow hazy day on earth. They couldn't see the surface of the interior because it was completely covered with clouds. It left a central core of five to six kilometers wide that was clear. The team that Commander Norton sent back down first was Mercer, Calvert and Myron. When they got to the first landing, they realized that they could take off their mask at this point because the air at this point was perfectly breathable and the humidity was at 80%. The humidity level they could explain, the oxygen level rising they couldn't. When they got down into the cloud layer, their visibility dropped to just a few meters. Once they got through the clouds, they noticed the waterfall. Its source was in the clouds somewhere. They also noticed that the sea was green instead of blue, and it seems that it was the plants in the sea that was pumping out the new oxygen. The wonder was that it only took 48 hours. They built a small raft out of six empty storage bins and they dragged it to the cylindrical sea. They were planning to use it to get to the island in the middle of the ocean and examine the structure that they called New York. Everyone believed that that city or whatever it was, was the real heart of Rama. They named their little raft Resolution. Sergeant Ruby Barnes took Jimmy, Boris and Peter and they headed off to the island. The water was alive with thousands of single cell microorganisms that were similar to plankton. It seemed that they must have existed in the billions right after the storm but now they were dwindling. New York was divided into three identical circular complexes and each complex was divided into three components. They found a stairway leading up to the island which was a virtual duplicate of the one they descended on the other side of the sea. When Commander Norton and his two companions got to the top, they found themselves standing on a wall that was 20 meters above the city and they began to explore. After they had made a complete traverse of the island, Commander Norton came to the conclusion that it wasn't a city, it was a machine. They wondered if it's a machine, what does it do? And the answer was maybe it uses the seawater for something. And what does it use the seawater for? And the answer was maybe to create ramans. From the shores of New York, Commander Norton watched the southern half of Rama and its 500 meter high cliff. And nowhere along its entire circle was there a flight of stairs or any other means of access. Commander Norton knew that sooner or later he would have to use explosives or laser beams to try and get into some of these structures, but he was reluctant to do that because he didn't want to behave as a technological barbarian smashing what he could not understand. After all, he was an uninvited visitor on this world and should act accordingly. Another thing was, it seems that the Ramans have planned for everything and he wasn't too anxious to find out what precautions they left to guard their property. Lieutenant James Park had built a sky bike for racing on the moon and he had smuggled it onto the Endeavour. Its name was Dragonfly and he got permission from Commander Norton to use it to try and get to the southern continent. Jimmy tested his sky biking skills doing orbits around the northern continent before getting ready for the rail trip to the south. 
It wasn't until he was on his way and at the edge of the cylindrical sea that he realized how dangerous a task he had taken on. He crossed to the island and flew around it a few times taking pictures before he headed on towards the southern continent. When he got to the southern dome, he realized that in just about every way, the southern and northern ends of Rama were completely different. Here, there were no triad of stairways, no narrow concentric plateaus, no sweeping curve from hub to plane. Instead, there was a central spike that was more than five kilometers long, extending along the axis, with six smaller ones half its size that were equally spaced around it. He pedaled up close to the large spike and opening up a small container, he pulled out a sphere about as big as a baseball and sent it to the spike where it stuck to the surface. He then pulled himself and his bike close to the spike and then touched it. He said it felt like glass. And as Jimmy began flying through the spikes closer and closer, a very low hum began interfering with his communications. They believed that he had entered some sort of intense magnetic field. They told him it could be dangerous so he should get out of there. Finally, Jimmy, taking as much pictures and readings as he can, turned towards the northern end and home. On his way back, he began to feel a sense of dread and it got so bad that he stopped to try and figure out what was making him feel that way. He felt something tickling the back of his hand and when he checked, every individual hair on his hand was standing straight up. And just as he called hub control to tell them he felt a static charge building up around him, that's when there was a flick of light behind him. When he looked back at the six little horns, all of them seemed to be on fire. He began pedaling furiously to try and get out of range before anything else happens. But the air became turbulent. And while this is going on, he was also hearing a faint rushing sound that was coming and growing in strength from the big horn. He of course kept pedaling and reporting everything to hub control. Just then, there was a big sheet of flame behind him. As he looked back, he could see it stretching from the big horn to each of the little horns. Jimmy fought to use the dragonfly as a parachute to land safely. He was halfway down when the fireworks display from the horns stopped. When he crashed, he was knocked unconscious. When he came through and he heard a noise, he looked around and saw a large crab-like creature dismantling the remains of the dragonfly. After he contacted hub control, he continued to watch the creature and wondered if it wasn't some sort of robot. Once the creature had finished taking apart the dragonfly, he headed for one of three pits that was on the southern continent. At the bottom of these pits were green liquid that seemed to be at the same level as the sea. And each of these pits had ramps going down to the bottom. These ramps were recessed into the wall. The creature got to the edge of the pit, dumped in the remains of the dragonfly, and in turn and headed in his direction. It ended up walking right by him and headed off towards the south. When Jimmy went and looked into the pit, he could see shapes beneath the water, and one of them that looked like a tank began its long journey up the ramp. But Jimmy decided it would be best if he didn't go exploring down those ramps. As he headed towards the sea, he reported on the areas he was walking through to hub control. Then he saw it, a hint of color in all of that metal around him. As he got closer, he realized it was a flower. It wasn't until he got very close that he saw it was three flowers packed together. Hub Control was delighted and didn't argue when he said he was going to go get it. He reached it and picked it and watched as the stem retreated back into the ground. But he had his flower. When Jimmy got to the edge of the cliff, he could see 500 meters down was Commander Norton and the Resolution. First, he threw the flower off the edge and once it was collected, he took off his shirt, made it a parachute and jumped. Once he was pulled out of the water, they noticed that the fireworks from the horns had begun again. And with it came a crackling roar. It lasted five minutes and then stopped. Then hub control called them, asked them if they felt the earthquake, which they didn't because they were on the ocean. The next thing they saw was a tidal wave racing towards them along the curve of this cylindrical sea. Ruby made sure that the resolution was in the deepest part of the sea when the wave passed under them. Then as they headed to shore, from under the sea came what looked like a starfish with some of its arms broken. Two more came up besides it and began dismantling it. 
hurry to shore before something came up and decided to dismantle them. Once they reached shore, Commander Norton decided not to tempt fate and go back on that sea again. So Commander Norton took measures to ensure that they wouldn't be surprised by any of the creatures that are now showing up in Rama. It didn't work because while they were relaxing, a creature showed up. It had a spherical body that was no larger than a football and it stood on three tripod-like legs and it had three expressionless eyes and it had three whip-like tendrils. It stared at them for a moment before ignoring them and examining everything around them. And when it moved, it moved very fast in a spinning-like motion that was very hard to keep track of. After it had examined all of the human belongings, ignored the human, it headed up towards hub control. Laura, of course, wanted to capture one and examine it, but she was not allowed to. Commander Norton was determined to make sure that none of his people create a situation that could be perceived as hostile. He didn't want to go down in history as the man who started the first interplanetary war. Soon there were hundreds of these spiders all over the place, both on the southern continent and on the northern continent. The only place they weren't was on the island of New York. The other thing was that they never seemed to visit the same place twice. Laura finally got her specimen when one of the spiders fell from the vertical face onto the first platform. She quickly took it back to the ship where she began dissecting it and what she found surprised her. Back on the moon, the Rama committee left, minus one member. The ambassador to Mercury sent his apologies he would not be able to make the meeting. In the rest of the meeting, they came to a couple of conclusions. One, Rama was a spacecraft that was able to change its orientation and its spin, and that they must acknowledge the possibility that Rama may not be going back out to the stars, but may become a orbiting body of the solar system. And if that's the case, they must be prepared to have Endeavour take off at any moment. Second, since Rama didn't change its spin using jets or any reaction devices, that left two possibilities. One, that it has internal gyroscopes or the equivalent, and they would be enormous. If they're there, where are they? Second, it is possible that it has some sort of reactionless propulsion system, a space drive. And if it does have a space drive, they will not be able to anticipate its behavior. And third, the dissection of the spider showed that it is powered by an internal organ similar to electric eels. So it doesn't have any need to eat or breathe. And it seemed to be designed for reconnaissance. It would also be perfectly at home in a vacuum. Each of the creatures in Rama seems to be designed to do one thing. And they all seem to be powered the same way. They seem to be biological robots. And as time go on, more and more complex creatures may be created. Commander Norton was down on the plains asleep when he received a message that there was a triple A priority code from headquarters for him, Commander's eyes only. The message warned him that Mercury had launched something on an intercept course with Rama. And while they wasn't sure, they thought it was a missile. And it was a nuclear device set to destroy Rama. At the General Assembly to the United Planets, the Ambassador for Mercury spoke. In the Assembly, the Ambassador for Mercury gave a little synopsis of what they know about Rama and that no one knows what its intentions are and that they have constantly underestimated its abilities and that they cannot take the chance that it may not be a threat. So Mercury has unilaterally taken it upon themselves to arm their missile and within the next few days before Rama reaches perihelion, a decision will be made whether to destroy it or not. They will give ample warning to the endeavor to have them escape within an hour's notice. They feel they're doing this not just for themselves but for the human species. Lieutenant Bowis Rodrigo came to Commander Norton with a plan to disable the missile. After thinking about it, Commander Norton gave the plan his approval. He boarded a stripped-down scooter and made the trip from Endeavour to the bomb in four minutes. The Endeavour then took off and placed itself behind the thickness of Rama. 
When he got to the bomb, it was 10 meters long by 3 meters in diameter. Once he began working on the bomb, it began to move. That's when Commander Norton received a message from Mercury telling him to leave the vicinity of Rama immediately. Boris completed his work disabling the bomb. They never quickly landed back on Rama. They would have two days before they would be too close to the sun and they would be forced to leave. Commander Norton went down into the place they call London and cut into one of the structures with lasers. Once inside, they saw row upon row of vertical crystalline columns about a meter wide stretching from the floor to the ceiling. There were hundreds of them marching on into the darkness beyond the reach of his light. The columns were not transparent from every angle and as one walked around them, objects would appear into view and then disappear again. They came to the conclusion that what they was looking at was an index catalog for 3D images. And in one of the columns they saw an elaborate harness or uniform that was made for a vertically standing creature that was much taller than a man. And from the uniform they could tell that the creature would have three upper limbs or arms. They were still speculating what the Roman would look like based on the uniform when they were called to come back outside because the lights were going out. With that, Commander Norton decided not to tempt faith and began evacuating. That's when they felt a slight tremor because Rama was beginning to turn. They were close to the top when they heard a whistling sound that seemed to come from everywhere. The whistling sound repeated several times and then the lights began to flash. As they looked, they could see that all of the bayats, the big ones, the small ones, they were all rushing to the sea faster than everyone had seen them move. By the time they got through the airlocks, Rama was dark once again. The endeavor was a hundred kilometers away from Rama. Then Rama began to accelerate away at a rate of 0.15 gravities. Once they used the last of the endeavors propellant to move it outward from the sun, Rama, using its strange space drive, was already 200,000 kilometers away. Everyone was so certain that Rama would lose speed and be captured by the sun's gravity and become a new planet of the solar system, it was doing the opposite, it was gaining speed and it seemed to be falling into the sun. Once it was 5 million kilometers from the sun and still accelerating, Rama began to spin a cocoon. Soon Rama was surrounded by a perfectly reflecting sphere that was 100 kilometers in diameter. Then the sphere began to turn into an ellipsoid. Then a glowing tube 100,000 kilometers long appeared in the upper atmosphere of the sun. Now Rama's strategy was clear. They came so close to the sun merely to tap its energy at the source so they could speed themselves even faster on their way to their ultimate unknown goal. Rama swept around the sun moving more swiftly than any other object had ever traveled through the solar system. Then it dropped below the elliptic plane and headed for the Greater Magellanic Cloud. Commander Norton got news from Mars that his son was conceived. Meanwhile, Dr. Piera woke up with a message in his mind that Ramans do everything in threes. And that is the end of the novel. I want to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a like, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.